welcome to our next presenter, uh, William Key, whose mentor is Dr. Peter Austin, will be presenting today um, on his thesis, which is entitled Dynamics of the American-Israeli Alliance. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Liam, and today I'm going to be discussing with you my honors thesis project, which, uh, as Dr. Aitman said, discusses the relationship between the United States and Israel and how it has evolved over the years. I want to thank Dr. Austin for mentoring me through this process and providing guidance along the way. The handout that some of you have is a list of the United States presidents from 1948 to the present day. So hold on to that because it's going to be a point of reference so you can see who is in charge of American policy making decisions during the key events that I'm going to be discussing. So here we have a map of Israel as it is currently constituted. So as you can see, it's bordered by Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. And the brown areas of the map are areas that are under Palestinian control. So before Israel became Israel, it was known as the Palestine Mandate and was under the control of the British government. So in 1948, when the British government withdrew, uh, fighting over control of Israel broke out between the Jewish population of the country and the Arab population. And then what ended up happening was the Jewish population prevailed and the state of Israel was still have to be exist, uh, come into existence. But there are still Palestinian Arabs that are living in Israel. So in those brown areas, they have a fair degree of autonomy and their government, which is known as the Palestinian National Authority, um, uh, governs the activities of the Palestinians. And then down there, uh, Gaza, which borders the Sinai Peninsula, that is technically a part of Israel, but it is controlled by the terrorist group Hamas. So even though Israel is technically a part of Israel, it exercises no real control there. So just keep this map in mind as I'm continuing to go through the presentation. So the overarching question is how did we get here? How did this relationship come about? And uh, what have been the key events that have shaped it over the years? That, that was the question that my thesis sought to explore. And how it started was this document right here. So this document is, was issued by the State Department under the presidency of Harry Truman in 1948, and what this document does is it makes the United States the first country to extend recognition to the new state of Israel. So when the British government pulled out of Palestine, the Jewish population formed the provisional government of Israel and declared its independence. And almost minutes after that, this document was issued where the United States extended de facto recognition to the government there. It's de facto recognition because the government hadn't been fully implemented then and, and was not, that didn't look like how it does in the current day. So it, it was a, a cautious form of recognition, if you will. But that made the United States the first country to recognize the state of Israel. And it has remained involved in the region to this day. And I'm gonna be flipping back and forth between this map and this timeline here, but look at this map. So you see that you have Israel and the countries that are bordering it. And following World War II, the United States entered into the Cold War with the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union was the U.S.'s primary adversary. And so the Soviet Union was attempting to gain significant influence in the region and spread communism to these countries. It failed to do so in Israel, so as a result, it turned its attention to Syria and Egypt in particular. And that is, it's not the, so that is where the Eisenhower Doctrine came into effect. And the Eisenhower Doctrine, named for President Eisenhower, focuses on keeping communism and the Soviet Union out of the Middle East, that, that's the crux of it, and that is what governed American policy, making decisions in the Middle East during uh, most of the Cold War. So the first key event in that timeline is the Suez Crisis of 1956. So in 1956, as you can see, 
Israel borders Egypt via the Sinai Peninsula. And then um, on the western side of the Sinai Peninsula is the Suez Canal. So Egypt refused to recognize Israel's sovereignty and closed off the Suez Canal to Israeli shipping. Understandably, this is a very important trade route and seriously crippled Israel's ability to build its economy. And Egypt came to this decision under the auspices of the Soviet Union, which was exercising significant influence in the Egyptian government. So as a result, Israel decided to invade the Sinai Peninsula and regain and uh, take over the Suez and open it up to a shipping. And an interesting uh, point in that was that President Eisenhower actually, he because the Soviet Union was so involved in Israel, he, or in Egypt, he was afraid that by Israel attacking a Soviet-controlled country, it was going to cause fighting to break out in the region and that the United States would be forced to become directly involved. So he actually um, commanded that Israel uh, withdraw from the Sinai Peninsula, which it did do and prevented conflict from breaking out on a more grand scale. However, it, Egypt just closed the Suez Canal again and was not allowing Israeli ships to pass through. So that brings us to the next event, the Six Day War of 1967, where a coalition of Arab states led by Egypt, Syria, and Jordan attempted to invade Israel. And Israel fought back and gained uh, and was able to capture the West Bank, where the majority of the Palestinian population lives, and the Golan Heights from Syria and Jordan, respectively. So the, the, the way the U.S. got involved in this was that these states that were attacking Israel all had significant Soviet influence and were being goaded on to attack Israel by the Soviet Union. So President Johnson, uh, Lyndon Johnson, in 1967, sent warships, to American warships, to the coast of Israel to deter uh, the Soviets sending their standing army down to the region and participating in the conflict. That was the first real time that the U.S. actually sent any direct support to Israel in its time of need. And that escalated in the Yom Kippur War of 1973, when Syria and Egypt again attempted to invade Israel, and Israel was in danger of being overrun. So President Nixon, recognizing this, instituted mm -hmm. Operation Nickel Grass, where he sent emergency supplies to Israel and allowed it to fend off its aggressors. And that was more of an escalation from the involvement of the 1967 war. The next event on there is the Camp David Accords, where Egypt and Israel finally ended their wars with one another, ended their aggression, entered into a peace agreement. And that was brokered by President Jimmy Carter. And the reason for that is by brokering that peace, the Soviet Union was finally expelled completely from Egypt, and the Suez Canal was no longer under Soviet influence. So that that was those events there primarily involved in Egypt. That's the primary aggression in Israel. Then in 1991, the Soviet Union collapses, and you would think that the, the Soviet threat is no more. But then the Soviet Union just resurfaces as Russia which has continued to be very active in the Middle East. And they have been active by funding um, the rebel forces in the Syrian civil war, which began in 2011. Seeing as Syria is directly north of Israel, that is a direct threat to Israel, which is a major ally of the United States, as we know. So the United States, as a result, has escalated its defense dealings with Israel in, attempt, in an attempt to strengthen it against potential aggression from Syria and Russia by proxy. And just recently in the news, actually, so Turkey, which is a, a NATO ally of the United States, just entered into a defense and missile pact with Russia. So it's moving away from, from Western influence and more to the, the Russian sphere of influence. So more than ever, that is a, is a threat to Israel, and Israel is an interest of the United States and the Middle East. So that's the crux of the Eisenhower Doctrine, keeping Russia and before Russia and the Soviet Union from getting too powerful there. 
the, so I'm going to flip to this map. So this kind of has a, a larger view of the Middle East. So on the left there, you have Israel. And then on the right, as you can see pretty big, it's Iran. And so Iran is regarded as an existential threat to Israel. Its government repeatedly expresses anti-Israeli rhetoric that it refuses to recognize the state of Israel and, and literally wants to destroy it, to blow it up to smithereens. And it has also professed anti-American rhetoric. And this began in 1979 when Iran had a revolution and transformed from a democracy to a theocratic regime that has been very anti-Western. And so that brought into effect the Carter Doctrine, named for President Jimmy Carter, which is about protecting US interests in the Persian Gulf, which is south of Iran there. And so that, that is a major area for oil exports. And obviously, in the past, that was an interest of the United States. But, but more so, it's really about the Carter Doctrine. It's about keeping Iran from becoming too powerful, because it has attempted to conquer wide swaths of the Middle East in the 1980s. It was in a war with Iraq. It was unsuccessful in, attempt, in its attempt to conquer Iraq. But if Iran were able to conquer Iraq, then there would be basically nothing standing between it and Israel. So the United States recognizes this and really has made an effort to fortify Israel to fend off potential direct aggression from Iran. Iran has been funding indirect aggression during this time, too. The terrorist organization Hezbollah in Lebanon is funded by the Iranian government, and they launch attacks on Israel almost every day. So even though it's not Iran directly, it's funding uh, groups that are attempting to weaken Israel. And so after the Iranian Revolution, the, the US got uh, very involved when it entered into the strategic cooperation agreement with Israel in 1981 under the Reagan administration. And what this did was this called for joint military exercises and escalated defense spending uh, from the United States to Israel to fortify it in the event that Iran should become too powerful and they would need to uh, cooperate together to protect their interests. And then Gulf War I in 1990 was, uh, came about when Iraq invaded Kuwait under Saddam Hussein. So on, on the surface, um, you might question, how does that have anything to do with Israel? Well, aside from the fact that Iraq was invading, was invading a sovereign member of the United Nations, and that should call for intervention, Iraq was supporting Palestinian terror organizations that were active in Israel. So that is a direct threat to Israel, of course, which is, again, an ally of the United States. So that is one reason why the United States felt compelled to get involved in World War I. And it stayed involved in Iraq during the Iraq War, which began in 2003, because, again, terrorism is a big concern. Um, Israel is frequently a target of terrorism, and so the United States just wants to make sure that Israel is strong and can, and can defend itself, because Israel is a big part of the United States' quest to end terrorism, both in the Middle East and abroad, because it is a strong, powerful ally in the Middle East. An interesting, uh, another interesting kind of inflection point occurred in 2015, when under President Obama, the United States lifted its sanctions against Iran and entered into the Iranian nuclear deal, which was talked about a lot in the news. Again, as I said, Iran is an existential threat to Israel. Understandably, this very much angered the Israeli government, and they were not pleased with it at all. And so President Trump has attempted to mend this by, in the past year, he ended the so that is a show of throwing United States support behind Israel. But by and large, the Carter Doctrine has persisted even from 1979 to now, because it's really about just keeping Iran from getting too powerful. This, this anti-Western theocratic regime, which is not just a threat to Israel, but to every country in the Middle East. 
So now the big question is where are we headed? Where, where is this going to go from here? It's been in the news a lot recently. Um, Israel just had elections and it's become their prime minister was re-elected, the U.S. embassy was moved from, was moved to Jerusalem uh, just this past year. So where is it going to go? Nothing is really concrete at this point, but the big development that has occurred was that the United States extended recognition to Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights, which was captured from Syria in the 1967 war. Before that, the Golan Heights was deemed as like a captured, occupied area. It wasn't really seen as under the control of Israel. It was still seen as an area that, that is, is truly Syrian. However, President Trump, as it says here, by recognizing Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights, He's bolstering the critical strategic and security importance for Israel and regional stability. So overall, it's not so much about the land as it is just showing that the United States supports Israel. It is a country that is key to the pursuit of stability and peace in the Middle East and is a major ally that cannot be overlooked as the crux of the world. Thank you. Are there any questions? Israel against Palestine. 
as the U.S.? How do we say, okay, yes, we want to be there for Israel, but also we can understand that ethically, you know, there, there's a large fight going on. We, you know, we want to be able to, you know, be there for, for Israel, but not be a part of that. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I think that, so in the news recently, President Trump has been talking about how there's going to be a, a peace agreement that he has proposed. That hasn't actually come into effect yet. But if, if you look at the, the map that I have there, sorry, I can't really pull it up, but the, the brown areas on the map are, are Palestinian. They're under Palestinian control. And Israel has made significant concessions over the years in granting them more autonomy. So I think that really there's, that's really an internal Israeli issue. I don't believe that the United States can do so much about that because so much of it is and ideology too, that it's tough to get a Western nation involved in that. But I think that Israel, from starting with the 1993 Oslo Accords, where it granted uh, more autonomy to the Palestinian National Authority and uh, granted more space to the Palestinians, I think that Israel's made significant strides there and is really doing its best to resolve that issue because it's, it's been going on forever, so I think they just want to solve it. Dr. Austin. Now our job this, well, this semester was not to solve any problem. Because it was like solving health care for one semester. We wouldn't have that kind of hubris. Likely, we're, and we're not going to solve the Palestinian issue. And, I, I mean, I exactly, appreciate, yeah. and he was warned about this question. I, I like so I'm so glad you're here and stay here. Uh, we're just trying to figure out what the problems are. Yeah. And if going forward, uh, we've got the basic puzzle pieces mm -hmm. in, my, in, uh, in, in perspective, we will achieve our goal. So with that, here we go. We, we knight you. Yes, sir. <laughs> sir. Sir. Sir.